Welcome to the B'nai B'rith International Podcast. I'm CEO Dan Mary Ashen. Thank you for tuning in today. I'm joined today by David Weinstein, the Washington, D.C.-based author of two books, including most recently The Eddie Cantor Story, A Jewish Life in Performance and Politics, published in 2017. In this biography, which is part of the Brandeis series in American Jewish History, Culture, and Life, David explores the extensive legacy of Eddie Cantor, an immensely popular Jewish entertainer of the early to mid-20th century, whose reach extended to radio, film, theater, and television. Today, David and I will be discussing Eddie Cantor in the context of his Jewish identity as an artist. How did he incorporate Jewish-themed material into his work? What was the relationship between Eddie Cantor's very vocal opposition to Nazism and anti-Semitism and his persona as a Jewish-American entertainer? And how did Cantor's many philanthropic efforts benefit the Jewish community? David, welcome to the program. Thank you for being here. And I think a a good way to um, get into this conversation would be to uh, hear a short audio clip of one of the songs uh, made famous by Eddie Cantor. David, how did this particular subject interest you to the point where you said you wanted to do a book about this entertainer? I have long been interested in pop culture. Uh, My first book was A History of the Dumont Television Network, which was America's first television network and early television. As I was doing research on Dumont, I looked at programming on all of the major networks, not just Dumont. And I came across Eddie Cantor's programming on NBC, the Colgate Comedy Hour, which was a very popular show. I had associated Cantor more with the 20s, more with the 30s. I was surprised to see him on early television, and I was surprised to see how good he was on early TV. He joked, he acted, he sang, he danced, and he had this charisma that I found really interesting. So as you do when you're working on a project, you file it aside and you move on to what you have to do, meaning write the book that you're working on. So I finished the Dumont book, and I circle back to Cantor as I was thinking of other projects. I wrote an article on American radio and resistance to Nazism during the 1930s and 40s, and I found that Eddie Cantor was a central figure in this story. He was a very vocal anti-Nazi activist, and we can maybe talk more about that later. Uh, but I f- So I'm finding he's popping up in different projects that I'm working on. So I decided for my next project, I wanted to do, learn more about him and potentially write a book about him. It was a chance for me to learn more about different types of pop culture, learn more about vaudeville, learn more about early theater, the Ziegfeld Follies, radio, in addition to television, which was really my area of expertise. And it was also a chance for me to learn more and explore more about my Jewish background and the world of my grandparents and even great-grandparents and American Jewish history from the first half of the 20th century. So his story is um, not atypical for many entertainers of that era. Born on the Lower East Side, 1892, uh, to parents who were, who were what? They were working uh, in, in, in those days. Uh, his mother was a homemaker. What, what was the family it, situation? It starts off as a traditional immigrant story. He's born to the, ch- uh, the child of Russian immigrants who had recently come over in 1892. As she said, Dan, then tragedy strikes. His mother dies when he's two years old, and his father either dies or abandons the family shortly after that. And at this point, the family really consists of Eddie and his grandmother, Esther Kantrowitz, from which Cantor uh, later got his name. That's his maternal grandmother. So he's an orphan by the age of three or four, raised by a grandmother 60 years older than he is, who's, and his grandmother is just trying to do what she can to pay the bills. She takes in uh, boarders. She sells rags. She's a matchmaker. And Cantor is basically alone on the Lower East Side uh, getting by as a child, and not surprisingly, he gets into all kinds of trouble. 
we associate him now with philanthropy, with this sort of geniality. But he was a tough guy. Growing up in the 1890s on the streets of New York, extremely poor, he tells stories about being in street gangs, breaking into stores. He later married a fellow Lower East Side girl named Ida Tobias. They stayed married until uh, she died in 1962. But he talks about, before they get married, uh, chasing one of Ida's, uh, one of his rivals, one of Ida's suitors, with a gun down the streets of the Lower East Side. And he said that he could have very easily ended up in prison rather than as the big star that he became. It could have gone either way. Uh, so he had a rough childhood, but he was also seeped in Jewish culture. His grandma Esther was very religiously observant, and there was a constant tension. She would want to bring him to religious services. He would try to sneak out of the house on Friday nights. Uh, the next morning, if she caught him, she would make him go to services. And he tells lots of stories about that, about that tension, and about uh, the poverty and the hard times he had growing up. But that also created a sympathy for the underdog, a sympathy for the less fortunate that informed his philanthropy. So where did it switch from life on the streets uh, to the world of entertainment? So this was an era of vaudeville. Um, how did he get into performing on the stage? Uh, Eddie Cantor really chose a life of show business out of desperation. Right now, when we think of people becoming stars, whether it's through shows like America's Got Talent or the classic stories, it's people with this great talent and this burning desire to express themselves artistically. For Cantor and his generation of performers, it was about one thing. It was about money. It was about needing to make a living. And for Cantor, he found that he couldn't do much of anything else. He was kicked out of school at around age 12 after he hit a teacher. He was bouncing around the streets of New York. He tried a few, quote, straight jobs working as a clerk. They didn't work out either. He got fired or he would quit out of boredom. And he didn't have very many opportunities, so he decided that he had nothing else to do. He might as well try to work, uh, try to enter show business. He starts off at talent shows. As you said, this is a world of theater. This is a world of vaudeville. And the lowest rung of this particular culture, of this theatrical culture, were talent shows. They were in rough neighborhoods, and they were with rough crowds. And if you did well, you might make 20, 30 bucks. If you didn't do well, they would throw things at you, and they might literally give you the hook, hook you off the stage. But Cantor did well enough that he was able to slowly work his way through vaudeville, a form of theatrical entertainment starting in New York theaters, and he would tour the country, and he built his career that way, and eventually he ended up uh, on Broadway with the Ziegfeld Follies, which was the biggest, glitziest, uh, highest-end entertainment of the time, starting in 1917. Where does radio enter into this? Because he was um, uh, an immensely popular radio star as well, and it seems that he, he hit that particular development at the right time. You're absolutely right. That's a great observation. Uh, Cantor became one of the first huge radio stars. He was very talented at moving among different media and also getting in early as different media were taking off. So he was very skillful in retooling his theatrical show for radio. What I mean by that, during the 1920s, he became one of America's biggest stars. At a time when theater was really the central form of entertainment, he toured the country several times with the Ziegfeld Follies during the late 19-teens, then with his, with his own headlining shows. So he's a huge star. Radio comes along, and it really takes off during the early 1930s. In 1931, Cantor enters radio. He develops a variety show where he's telling jokes, he has occasional guests on, and it's enormously popular. He sets all kinds of records that still stand for ratings during the early 1930s with his comedy show. Uh, he jokes about the Depression. He brings in uh, running gags and running routines, and he's enormously successful, and that really brings him into homes across the country. He had toured with the Ziegfeld Follies, but through radio during the 1930s, everybody knows Eddie Cantor. 
Simultaneously, he's also starring in films, in musicals that are also very popular. And he's very smart about cross-promoting them. He'll talk about his films on radio. He'll do promotional shots for the films, promotional pictures for these musicals, and he'll make sure a radio microphone is part of it. So he's really a multimedia star and ubiquitous in American culture during the early 1930s. Now, how much of his act in vaudeville and then in radio, and we haven't gotten to movies yet, but those two areas, how much of it uh, reflected his Jewish background and his Jewish persona? Uh, Cantor is one of the first, along with Fanny Bryce, in really developing what we would recognize as modern Jewish comedy. Uh, during the late teens and 1920s, as Cantor's coming up, a lot of the comedy involving Jews is grossly stereotypical. Uh, Jews with big noses, Jews with very heavy accents, greenhorns who don't understand what's going on. And in fact, the B'nai B'rith Anti-Defamation League during this time is doing a lot of work uh, policing and criticizing and trying to eliminate some of the grossest stereotypes in pop culture. Cantor is different. He's Jewish without being grossly stereotypical. You're laughing with him, you're not laughing at him. And that's a big distinction. And uh, for ex he did not uh, ha come under the sort of scrutiny and criticism from groups like the Anti-Defamation League that some of his contemporaries did because of this. And what I mean by that is he's using kosher food, for example, or Yiddish phrases as part of his act affectionately and quickly, the way many of the people at the time would have used it as they're becoming American but still incorporating Jewish culture But not into their stereotyping lives. on the stage. Not stereotyping, or, or. exactly, exactly. He might be a quick-talking salesman, and today we might see it as a little bit stereotypical, but at the time people would have seen that kind of character as the kind of person that you would have run into on the streets of New York. He's affectionate and he's not going over the top with the stereotypes. And this is representing a new type of Jewish comedy. Uh, there are still a couple of films that have survived where you can see Cantor doing this. One is a 1929 film, and there are clips on YouTube of a routine he did called Belt in the Back, where he plays a fast talking Jewish tailor. Many years later, Martin Scorsese called this particular scene, quote, the essence of Jewish comedy. And you can see the roots of everything and everybody, from Don Rickles to Larry David to Mel Brooks, in this type of routine where Cantor's playing a fast-talking salesman. He occasionally lapses into Yiddish, but he's quick-witted. You're rooting for him, and you admire him for his wits, and he's showing positive traits and positive characteristics that are speaking to Jewish and non-Jewish audiences. Ida, sweet as apple, apple, sour, whiter. Sweeter than all that I know. Oh, oh, oh. Now, movies were very big in his career, uh, very popular. Um, he he lived in New York. Did he also live in Los Angeles, or he went back and forth, or did he ultimately move to Los Angeles because of the movies? He ultimately moved to Los Angeles along with a lot of the others because of movies, and then as the technology changes in radio, he can start to do radio shows from Los Angeles, whereas earlier in the decade, New York was really the center for radio. So he does move to Los Angeles along with the other stars as the show business world really shifts. Uh, but he always kept an affection for New York and a New York style, even as he, along with several others, moved out to California. There are a couple of names that come up in the book uh, uh -huh. uh, in, in a number of chapters. Uh, George Burns, uh, George Jessel uh, are two. Um, were these were these friends? Were these personal friends? Was there a uh, was there a gang of of, of, of these comedians uh, who would meet uh, for breakfast every week or something like that? That's a terrific question. Uh, they were show business friends. 
And later there became almost a mythology around them. And later in life, as they were in semi-retirement, they would sit around the Hillcrest Country Club in Beverly Hills, schmoozing over bagels and locks and joking with each other. And it's become a sort of mythology. And it's also the kind of thing that people like Lenny Bruce reacted against, this sort of clubby group of old Jewish comedians, uh, the famous routine in which he calls both B'nai B'rith and Eddie Cantor, Guyish, as he's classifying Jewish and Guyish. He was wrong about both, by the way. Uh, but there was a sense later in life and that they were friends. And Cantor and Jessel go way back to well before they were stars, working together in lower-rung vaudeville shows together. Uh, but the truth is they were all so busy. They were always working they were always crisscrossing the country doing shows, doing benefits, doing radio, doing film. It's hard to tell how much they actually hung out together, except when they might see each other at these benefit shows. But later in life, there became a friendship. But there also was a little bit of self-mythologizing earlier in their careers, where they would talk about my good friend Al Jolson or my good friend George Burns. And it's questionable the way we think of friendship, how close they really how close they really were. So television comes along uh, in the 1940s, uh, and um, uh, Eddie Cantor is now into his into his 50s, um, and he makes that transition as well. Um, and how did that happen? When uh, when television comes along, almost all of it is live, and all of the key programs are live. This was before videotape was invented or was widely used. And the networks really needed performers who were comfortable live. So they reached back to theatrical performers who were comfortable on stage and who could do live television, as opposed to film stars who might need multiple takes and editing, because again, everything was live. And there was also a need for entertainment. Television needed to give people something that they couldn't get elsewhere. In other words, rather than going out to the Broadway show or coming to New York for Broadway, they were bringing Broadway to the country. And Cantor was very skillful at performing like this. And he brought back a lot of his old routines from the teens, from the 20s, from the 30s. He was really a cultural institution at this point, And people loved it. The, um, the subtitle of your book is A Jewish Life in Performance and Politics. And I want to switch to that a part of his life. Um, he was an early, um, uh, an outspoken voice against uh, Hitler, Nazism, um, anti-Semitism. He was uh, quoted many times. He spoke on the subject. Um, how did this separate him out from his colleagues? And, and why, why do you think he chose to do this? Because at that time, in the 1930s, um, the community, you know, Israel is not yet, the modern state of Israel, not yet in place. Um, and much has been written and said uh, about uh, the, the place of the Jewish community in the United States at, at that time. Um, what made it, uh, what made Eddie Cantor the, the person who said, I'm going to take that extra step and, and speak out like this? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's Cantor was extraordinary. And one of the parts of the book, one aspect of the book that I'm especially proud of and that I personally learned a lot in doing the research from was that he was a proud, open, vehement anti-Nazi during the 1930s. Today, it should be obvious, well, of course, you're going to oppose Nazism. But in that climate, many people, especially many public figures, did not. There was a great deal of anti-Semitism. There were many institutional barriers for performers that made it hard to express any politics, let alone unpopular politics. And being openly Jewish and speaking out against Nazism from a Jewish perspective was controversial. The radio sponsors didn't like it. The radio networks didn't like it. The public didn't like it. It took a tremendous amount of courage for Cantor to do what he did. So what did he do? Starting in 1933, 
He's working with Leon Lewis, who was a Los Angeles lawyer who was doing a lot of anti-Nazi work and collecting information on Nazism. He's working with the Anti-Defamation League. In 1935, he publicly starts opposing figures like Father Charles Coughlin. In fact, he made a speech at a B'nai B'rith meeting in 1935 in which he speaks out against Father Coughlin, says anti-Semitism is a real threat in America. What's happening in Nazi Germany can happen here. And that sparked a lot of controversy as to how vocally Jews should speak out against Nazism and anti-Semitism because there was a real fear of popular backlash. But Cantor went ahead and did that. Time magazine covered this speech, and it was somewhat patronizing about Cantor and his Jewishness, diminishing him for, for speaking out as he did. But he kept going. He starts working with Hadassah, the Women's Zionist Organization of America. Hadassah is a relatively small group at this time, but they're doing a lot of work to raise funds with an organization called Youth Aliyah. Youth Aliyah is based in Germany, and Youth Aliyah is facilitating the emigration of young people from Austria, from Germany, uh, to Palestine. Cantor not only raises funds for them, he speaks at small local chapters. He uses this work to cement his connection to the Jewish community. He also is speaking out specifically about anti-Semitism. He's not as interested, for example, in building up Jewish Palestine the way Hadassah is. He's interested in the threat of anti-Semitism, and this is extremely controversial. In 1938, he speaks out against Henry Ford after Ford accepted a medal from Germany. Ford was well known for his anti-Semitism throughout the 1920s, and Cantor called him a damn fool for accepting a medal from Hitler. And he said about Ford, I question his patriotism and I question his Christianity. Ford was an iconic figure in American culture at this time, akin to maybe, I don't know, a Steve Jobs or a Bill Gates or somebody like that. And for Cantor to speak like that against him was very courageous and also very controversial. Another bride, another groom, another sunny honeymoon, another season, another reason. For making whoopee The choir sings Here comes the bride Another victim Is by her side Before we entered the war Yeah, yeah In, in, in 1941 uh-huh. uh, he, he was uh, speaking out uh, About uh, the threat of, of Nazism uh, And made some people nervous here, I assume the sponsors, and you, as you write about in the book, but it didn't seem to, it didn't seem to affect him, nor did it affect his ratings. He he seemed to to thrive on this. Dan, that's a great point. He it didn't affect his popularity. It didn't affect his numbers. His ratings remained high. Uh, however, it sparked a very vocal minority speaking out against him, writing letters, threatening boycotts. And even though his popularity did not suffer because of his political activism, the networks didn't like controversy. The sponsors didn't like controversy. At this point, Cantor is a huge radio star, and radio is his primary way of making a living. That's really what he's doing by the late 1930s. And it was as much about the timidity and the fears of networks and sponsors as even a decline uh, as anything else that really hurt Cantor's career. After the war, he um, was equally outspoken on issues like the blacklist, which affected many in Hollywood. Um, again, uh, it, it seemed to be that, that principle was the main driving factor um, rather than his own personal situation uh, or his... Uh, at that particular point, his, his income or uh, whatever uh, programs or, or uh, films or whatever that he was involved in. Uh, say something about that, because that's a, 
in a way, uh, we can't relate to it now as years pass, uh, as, as we did some years earlier, but that was a pretty gutsy thing to do at the time. It really was. And one of the themes and one of the threads that runs through the book in Cantor's life that I found really exciting was his principles, was his, he was a mensch. Whether it was doing a lot for charity, whether it was speaking his conscience, trying to do what was right. And you mentioned the 1950s. This certainly continued then. Uh, he spoke out against Joseph McCarthy in 1950 from the stage of Carnegie Hall. He was doing a one-man show, and he said, we're here to have a night of light entertainment where we don't have to think about evil things or talk about evil things like the H-bomb, Joseph McCarthy, and other, other evils that want to destroy mankind. This was in 1950, shortly after Joseph McCarthy made a speech in Wheeling, West Virginia, calling out communists in government, and it took courage to speak out like that. Shortly after that, Cantor spoke in defense of blacklisted actors as he toured the country. He would end his show by defending them and criticizing the blacklist. Cantor was usually very sensitive to how far he could go without destroying his career, how much he could speak out, how much he could follow his principles, what he could say or do without going overboard. And that's one of the things that I admired about him also, his savvy. But in 1951, at a certain point, he realizes, given the strength of the blacklist and given his somewhat precarious position, that he cannot continue to speak like this. So he says less. Uh, but again, he's constantly balancing that, and he's constantly sp trying to make a principled stand. And he did visit Israel uh, several times. He visited Israel. He was very supportive of Israel. Uh, starting really after World War II, he does a lot to bring attention to the problem of displaced persons. And then he becomes a huge fundraiser for Israel bonds. He visits Israel. He makes a film based on his visit. And he has a series of uh, benefit birthday dinners for Israel bonds. And for him, it was really the fulfillment of many years of work. He didn't explicitly call himself a Zionist, but he was very pro-Israel. And he really did work uh, for the establishment of Israel, and he felt, he recognized the importance of a Jewish homeland. He frequently spoke about it in terms of democracy and a continuation of American values in the Middle East, which was very much in keeping with the rhetoric of the times. Well, we're proud of the fact that he was a, a member of B'nai B'rith. Uh -huh. um, and uh, uh, you mentioned B'nai B'rith a number of times in your book. But as you said, he um, gave his time, gave of his time uh, to um, so many different Jewish organizations that, uh, you know, when I think about uh, is um, we uh, bought our first uh, television about 1954. It was a 10-inch a RCA in a, in a cabinet that was uh, uh, bigger than uh, this table. We're at a big round table here. Um, and you had to get up close to the TV to, uh, to see the programs. Uh, and when, I don't know if it was the Colgate Comedy Hour or he could have been guest starring on another variety program on TV, but if my mother knew that Eddie Cantor was going to be on TV. She told us, Eddie Cantor is going to be on tonight. And I can picture him, um, I, of course, can't remember, I was uh, five years old at the time, but I can picture him, an image of him, um, uh, flickering on that, on that black and white screen. And I've often thought that in addition to um, enjoying his, his comedy, uh, uh, that there was something else there that uh, my parents knew that, that this was a stand-up Jewish guy, uh, that he was, uh, he was one of them. Uh, and uh, your book um, makes that point many times over. And uh, David, really, I th all of us are grateful uh, that you have um, brought this story back as is often happens, you know, we say we said in the introduction that he was an immensely popular figure. But if you went out on the street here today, 
uh, and you ask 10 people about Eddie Cantor, uh, they would certain have to, certainly have to be of a certain age, and even those of a certain age would have to think for a minute. Um, but this is a, it's a great story about a great period in American Jewish history, and uh, we're indebted to you for, uh, for putting this book together. Thank you, Dan. Well, thank you, everyone, for listening to our podcast today. Please visit our website, benebrith.org, like our Facebook page, and follow us on Twitter. Subscribe on your smartphone through the podcast app for iPhone or through Google Play for Android. And lastly, tell a friend about us. For my guest, David Weinstein, I'm Dan Mary Ashen. We'll talk to you next time on the B'nai B'rith International Podcast. Mm-hmm.